the one separating you from the, the coffee break, so I'll try to make it as painless as possible. Um, I'm, I'm Mikael Bijawi. I'm uh, Josh's partner at Eastwind. Um, I am based in New York, although from my accent you can guess that I'm not native from Brooklyn. I fell into um, EdTech about 15 years ago when we talked about definitions. Uh, it was called e-learning, i-learning, and other names. Um, uh, and I've been covering it ever since. First, when I was at McGraw Hill Education, when I was in charge of um, uh, strategy and investments, and then um, uh, since for the past 10 years as an investment banker, um, we heard from from the previous panels about the the, the conflict between for profit and and social good, and thought it would be a perfect segue into the invest, Impact Investment Panel, and I, I'd love to welcome uh, our panelists, uh, Janet, Yoel, Cecile, Omri, and Vanessa to the stage. So before we get started, I was I was told that this is the the only panel where women are are a majority, um, and which this is us. which is great for us. Um, and uh, and it was done on purpose, just to be clear. What? It was done on purpose. Um, so just like the previous two panels, I, I would love the the panelists to introduce themselves and and tell us how how they got involved with with impact investment and to the extent that's relevant, what, how they define it. And maybe we start with uh, Vanessa. Good afternoon. My name is Vanessa Bartram. I'm originally from US, made Aliyah three years ago. Recently started an impact investment fund called Zora. And we are making investments in education, health, poverty alleviation, and the environment. Uh, we're a little bit different than a typical fund in that we do our investments deal by deal. So we just had our first pitch event in New York and San Francisco two weeks ago, um, where we brought four Israeli impact entrepreneurs to pitch to our investors there, um, and are in process now of closing on our first three investments um, from those pitch events. Um, in conjunction, uh, I also started with my partner, Avi Deutsch, in an organization called Levan in the US, uh, which is really to educate the US Jewish community about impact investment and to use it as a way of engagement with Israel. Omri. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Omri Boral. I'm from Tech for Good. And we're also operating a bit differently than other uh, funds. We're actually, we've started by working with entrepreneurs and we have programs in Israel and in Singapore. We're now developing into other countries. And our idea is to really create an ecosystem which is something that we see as crucial for entrepreneurs, for definitely for impact entrepreneurs to uh, develop their startup and actually get to a stage where their solution is applicable. Um, and we've discovered that the one thing that's usually stopping a lot of them is um, is, is the, the first seed round or even pre-seed, which is very difficult for impact entrepreneurs to um, to find the resources to, to, to get the money from. Um, and so we've, we're now constructing um, a seed impact fund which will invest in startups, hopefully, in Israel to begin with. Uh, I'm Cecile Relilius. Uh, I'm the founder and managing partner of uh, Impact First Investments, which is Israel's uh, first venture capital fund in the impact space, uh, which really means that we're a fund which uh, is very similar to a venture capital fund, very much like uh, Uri Adoni, who sat here before, uh, was um, describing. Uh, only our focus is technology for social impact. So we look at uh, global impact, global social impact, because technology is scalable. So we are creating the meeting place between Israeli technology and the startup nation, like everybody knows, and global social impact and social good. And that can be in any domain, it can be in uh, financial inclusion, in uh, disabilities, in education, in uh, healthcare, in whatever uh, domain. We are uh, very open to, to that. We're really feeling like we're building the um, 
the playground for impact uh, entrepreneurs to come and play, so we welcome any kind of uh, domain. Uh, and we are helped by a lot of people from our industry, from the venture capital and uh, high-tech industry, to mentor and, uh, and screen the companies and uh, go with them a long way in order to bring them uh, to growth. Um, we are uh, partnering with uh, Tech for Good in, uh, in where we see the early stage uh, entrepreneurs where they're still too early for us to invest in, but still we like to focus on them and try to help them get to the stage where they're uh, uh, ready for investment. Um, and we're basically looking at amazing companies, great companies, great teams with a great mission and a very solid and strong business model. Thank you, Cecile. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Yoel Cheshin. I'm uh, the founder and uh, the chairman of the 2B Group. 2B Group is a, a tool for social change. That's what I call it. It consists of three branches. 2B Finance, which concerns the capital markets. 2B Angels, which is a high-tech fund. And 2B Community, which is my baby. This is an impact investing fund with a unique model uh, with the goal to uh, promote and uh, strengthen regular businesses that allocate a large sum of their profits to social causes, to NGOs, in order to relieve their burden on philanthropy. Nowadays, uh, uh, NGOs promote basic civil rights, basic social rights, and a large uh, sum of what they do is based on philanthropy models. Philanthropy is great, but our goal is to minimize philanthropy only to the places where it's absolutely needed and where we, where we can find a business model that's for the better. So we, our, like I said, our model is to build regular businesses that allocate a large sum of the portion of the profit to social causes in a very unique model that I might elaborate later on. Thank you. I'm Janet Pahima. I'm in the International Corporate Transactions Partner at Herzog Fox Neman. Like Shibolet, it's one of the other big leading, one of the largest law firms in Tel Aviv. Pleasure to be here. Um, before I say any more, I want to make a word of comment to all of you entrepreneurs who are still in the room, raise your hands. I'm glad you're all here. The vocabulary you're going to be hearing today about impact investment is very important in your world. To all the entrepreneurs outside getting coffee, well, sorry about that. So when I was asked why I'm on this panel, it was more like, why are you on this panel? Like, you're a lawyer. Well, the reason is, you need lawyers everywhere. And especially in an area like impact investment. Because you have to understand how you get alignment between your shareholders and the company when you're in ed tech or anything else. What obligations as an ed tech company are your shareholders going to put on you? And how are you going to be able to measure after whether your objectives have been met? What are going to be the consequences to you when you have not met your objectives? These all need to be worked out in contracts, which is where we come in. The problem is very often your professional advisors may not understand what your impact investors are actually trying to do. And for that, Herzog Fox Neman set up a unique impact investment practice area to handle the questions of contractual relations, legal restrictions, government incentives, structural alternatives to support the whole ecosystem from a legal side, to help the relations between entrepreneurs and philanthropists and investors. Now you asked for a definition. By luck, I brought a definition with me. This is the definition of impact investment used by GIN, the Global in Impact Investment Network. It's considered sort of the trade association of all impact investment funds headquartered in the US. And they define this as investments made into companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate social and environmental impact alongside financial return. This can be in emerging markets or developed markets, and it can have a below market rate or a market rate of return. So isn't, because we're talking about education, isn't everything impact uh, in ed tech? And then what's the relevance of the category? Maybe Yoel, if you want to take. I think uh, um, I have a problem with the, with the concept of impact investing, because I think 
all businesses and all corporations should be uh, should have this double bottom line. This is what I call a healthy corporate. A healthy corporate generates some kind of gives some kind of service or some kind of product to the cons to consumers on one hand, and which is supposed to leverage their life to give them a better life. This way or the other, whether it's a, a supplying bread that could be if supplying bread could be also impact and also ways, yeah, ways uh, this startup that made. A, a, a lot of money to their investors is quite has a lot of impact. We all get uh, maps uh, for free. All citizens get map, maps for free. So I think uh, uh, defining something as an impact has a problem uh, in terms of the, there should be a, shouldn't be such a strong distinction between a, 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 a corporates for impact and co corporates for profits. Because once you say this is an impact investing fund or this is an impact uh, corporate or startup, then you have a distinction. All the other ones, they, they, they uh, uh, ruin the world. We help the world, they ruin the world. This is not the right thing. Although, since we live in an era where the, the bottom line is to maximize profit, I think it's good to uh, focus on things that you focus on the, on the intention. Yeah, but when you come to think of it, did Mark Zuckerberg intend to improve the world? I don't know, but as a matter of fact, he did an amazingly, a quite amazingly great job to improve the world. So I think, like I said, every corporate should have some kind of impact. Actually, everybody has some kind of impact. You have employees, even Dubek, even a, a corporates who a manufacture cigarettes, they have some kind of good impact. So we need to uh, be more accurate on what impact is, and as far as I'm concerned, the intention is not that important. Actually, when you focus on the intention, you go too much to the side of philanthropy. If you have a good intention, then it might be problematic not to have a good business model in order to maintain and sustain the corporate uh, uh, with, uh, under a business model, which is the most important thing. Like yeah. Janet or I Cecile? Think, yeah. I think it should always, it's always supposed to be Alongside, alongside a financial return, never by itself. But the important thing of impact is, is every ed tech company impact? Probably not. Are most of them? Probably. Because you have to look at the social problem they're trying to address. So if the social problem is to help the upper echelons of university students do even better, to make our high tech people even better, to make that upper 3% even better, that's not gonna be considered impact investment. If we're trying to increase education in the periphery and in areas that don't have good educational opportunities and we're using technology to help them, that's gonna be considered an impact investment. See, that's why you need lawyers. <laughs> they will tell the people what you actually mean to say, but better. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta pay for it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, for sure. Um, yeah, there's. The, the, the issue that uh, you all raised is not something we can resolve in two minutes. Uh, and, and there are really different uh, ways of looking at impact investing. So instead of going into that discussion, and uh, you all and I have been talking about this for ages, and we will probably be talking about this for ages further, um, I, uh, I'll just answer your question about education. And uh, I'm, I'm being asked this question a lot. Um, one thing that we focus on is healthcare. And I'll give the answer on the healthcare side, so because it's uh, easier maybe to understand. Um, so people say, okay, so healthcare, any healthcare is impact, right? I mean, if you're about saving lives and you're about treating people and b providing them better quality of life, then obviously you're going to make impact. But it doesn't mean that every company, and certainly every technology company in the healthcare space is an impact company. Uh, and th yes, there is a lot to be said about the intention of the, of the entrepreneurs. There's a lot to be said about their proactive uh, way of solving or addressing a, a, a social issue. And it also depends on where you as the investor or you as the company where, want to be in terms of is your focus to um, uh, improve the lives of people who are 95 years old to become 98 to have a better life quality or, or longer life through healthcare services? Is that impact? No. Uh, do you want to create access to healthcare to people, for people in developing countries while developing a solid business model that will maximize profits? Yes, that's impact. So, uh, same for education. Now, I haven't seen enough uh, edtech companies to make the same differentiation as I do with healthcare. Um, I haven't seen, so, so far everything I've seen is pretty much in the impact space. Uh, Although I'm pretty sure that, that a certain percentage of the edtech companies are not, would not be considered impact. But 
broadly speaking, it's pretty much uh, it. And another problem in the uh, edtech uh, space, I think, is that there isn't enough uh, knowledge on um, on investing in edtech companies, and not enough track record, and not enough uh, years uh, have gone by since investors started making these investments. And as opposed to healthcare, where you can uh, probably easily uh, get funded if you have a good company with EdTech, probably not. So that pushes it even further into the impact space. Uh, to give you a, a similar example, if you have a product that is applicable for developing countries uh, in whatever domain, even if it's not per se impact, because of the geography, it's probably going to go into the impact space. So it's not a black and white uh, uh, answer, but you know there is there is something to be said about impact and about the the um, intentionality of the of the funders and the entrepreneurs that is very important. Amri, um, you wanted to add something? I just I just wanted to add another um, aspect which I think is important and I see a lot of entrepreneurs that are trying to figure out uh, their way around it. Um, a lot of people argue about the definition of what is social, what is impact, and in many cases I think that people sometimes forget to look at how the organization is functioning, what's the operation built like, how the social aspects are inserted, are intrinsic to the business model and to the business activity of the organization, the entire activity of it. It's not like an add-on where you have a business activity, you do it like any other business, it's profit maximizing, etc. And then you have some kind of line of business that is more, you know, for, um, for sometimes um, developing countries or for um, lower social economic, um, um, help me out, social income uh, um, populations. It's not that. It's having different mechanisms to, um, to, to make decisions in your organization. Every decision should be based on business aspects and social aspects together. And it's not something that you can push aside when it's easier and, co and more comfortable, um, which, which is it's, it's a different perception. And the double bottom line movement or the double bottom line um, um, issue is something that should be going with you uh, through the entire process. Um, so that's it. Um, so we've got impact investors and, and advisors to the, to the community that are essentially captive to, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but captive to education and healthcare. Um, and I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs here. Are you seeing enough deal flow? Okay, so that's the answer. Um, no. So, what's the problem? I think it's a developing market. We've just started the concept of impact investment. Uh, what I believe that what is going to happen, that this legislator throughout the years is going to make things much better. That is going to give different kinds of incentives to the impact investment world as it gives to the high-tech sector, for instance. In the high-tech sector, you have very strong incentives such as uh, incubators that leverage your money 85%, uh, which is quite amazing. If you had such an incubator for impact investing, that could take the, uh, 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 the startups that are somewhere in between a for-profit and non-profit and bring uh, uh, strengthen them in a way that it makes them a very good company to invest in. And I think uh, uh, there is emergence and awakening of more and more uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, understanding, deeply understanding, especially the younger generation, that this is what we need now. So what I believe that is going to become stronger and stronger every year. I believe that now we're behind the developed countries in the Western uh, countries, such as the United States and England, such as legislation and understanding, deep understanding of what impact investing is. But I truly believe that we're going to be in the lead. Meaning, it's a, 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 if you want to, a, a, to really a, live an extraordinary life, so come to Israel and live here because I, I think the, the impact investing scene is going to be just great. No? <laughs> um, we're not seeing enough good deal flow. Uh, okay. We're getting um, very early, early stage companies, uh, sometimes just ideas. Um, 
which are great, but as an investor, uh, it's, it's just not mature enough. Uh, we are seeing nice ideas with nice technology solutions that have no business model, or the business models are very shaky. Um, we see people with um, sparks in their eyes wanting to solve this amazing social problem, but with no management skills. Uh, so at the end of the day, as an investor, we want to uh, succeed, we want to make huge impact. And we also want to return capital to our LPs, obviously, but we want to make huge impact. So if we invest in the wrong companies, then we're not going to make any impact. We're going to lose the money, but we're also not going to make any impact. And the alternative cost of that is very high. So we have to choose very, very carefully which, which companies we invest in. So, so far, all the ed tech companies that we've seen just didn't have all the right components. They weren't great companies, or they were very, very, very early and needed a lot of care until they could be investment ready. So it's a quality problem, not a volume problem, if you try to... I haven't seen a lot of them either, so I don't know what's the volume. So you've got volume and quality. I, I, you know, as I said, we're kind of um, uh, overall impact uh, uh, for, uh, you know, technology for impact globally. We're not specifically ed tech oriented, so we see pretty much everything. I haven't seen a lot, and the ones I've seen, some of them were pretty good, but they have a long way to go. Have you made an investment in ed tech? In ed tech, no, okay. not yet. I wish I could. Um, from what we've seen, a lot of the ed tech companies are still very focused on making their connections with the government. And they see it as um, a very, very large part of their business model, uh, providing services to the government or to the education system, which has two problems. First, the, pr the, the process is very, very long. And the barriers to getting inside the, uh, so the, the education system are very high. Plus, there's something very, very local about it. The education system here is very different than the one in the UK. And if you're a startup, if you're basing your uh, business model on technology, then you have to be scalable and you have to realize how you're, the social issue that you're treating, that you have the attributes that are global or at least that have a few markets. And we've been seeing it actually not in Israel, but in other places in the world, we see entrepreneurs that are in the ed tech industry and are oriented, you know, that are looking at various markets. And I think that's, that's part of the, um, the developments that we need to see happening here. Um, we do see some very, very interesting technology. So I think that when you talk about creativity and the Israeli DNA, entrepreneurial DNA, it definitely is something that you can, that reflects uh, from the ed tech industry, but still, as, as others have said, it's still very early stage. Of the ed tech investment deal flow that we've seen recently, um, the majority of, majority of it has been very early stage. Um, it's been companies that are focused on um, sort of local K-12 learners and problems that they're facing. One of the main challenges that I've seen with a lot of these companies is that they have a B2C model, uh, that they really have no sort of marketing capacity or sales channel to properly address and scale. Um, we're in process now of closing an investment in an ed tech company. Um, the company was particularly attractive because I think they did a great job of using Israel as sort of a, a local testing ground and now is very aggressively moving that to other markets and is now selling in five different countries um, around the world. So that was something for me that, um, you know, they have the scale of being able to sell to school systems, but again, with the recognition that every country has a very different matrix of purchasers there, whether it's school systems or education publishers. So I want to, oh, you want to say, go ahead. I think impact investing as it of itself is a term that's been developing for probably less than 10 years around the world. It's a developing concept. The investors are also developing in what they're looking for. And maybe the latest range, as they develop, they want to see more measurable results of their investments. It seems to me that in EdTech, you built in may have some of the easier metrics to establish because there are a lot of things that we've already seen on the board today. Lowering drop-up rates, dro lowering up drop-out rates, increasing grades, graduating high school, these are things that are very easy to measure so you can see improvement. So you're offering, if your programs, obviously it needs to be a good company that can be profitable with a business model and all that, 
But in terms of being able to have matrix that you can establish for your social side, what's the problem, what are you trying to achieve, I think EdTech has a big advantage over other social impact areas, and that should be taken advantage of. So I want to pick up on a couple of things you said, which was the companies are, are not prepared. And Yoel said, we need sort of a, a stepping stone before that, which is, you know, government funded. So is the, is the approach here is, is legislative and, and budgetary as opposed to being driven by the private sector? And uh, if yes, how, we, how do we do that? Um, I'll start. Um, the, uh, the stepping stone needs to be similar. You all, you all talked about the uh, incubator system yes. in Israel. So that's, that's when we're looking towards the government, then uh, there are no incubators right now for social impact, generally, and definitely not for ed tech. Uh, in order to um, be able to compete on an incubator, we have to, to create a partnership with major uh, international players that have deep enough pockets that will be able to invest in the companies further. Because this is, the, the chief scientist has been uh, working on the incubator model for years now. And only in the past 10 years, even less, it's been, uh, the, the model is such that it's working. And we're even partners our, ourselves in the, in the incubator on, um, on digital healthcare, uh, together with uh, three giants, is Pitango Venture Capital, Medtronic, and uh, IBM, together with the uh, um, Ramba Medical Center. And it's true that it's 80%, 85% leverage on the, on the capital from the government, but you also have to bring your own capital, you have to bring the ability to invest further in the companies, so it's, it's a huge model. So for us to be able to um, create a successful incubator that would be funded by the government that can do uh, early stage impact investing, we need to bring international players that have deep pockets. Okay, so that's one thing, and, and that it's definitely the role of the government to look at ed tech and, and impact as part of their uh, policy. Um, on top of that, and until that happens, because governments tend to move slowly, um, it's maybe it's a good idea to think about the role of philanthropy in that uh, respect. Uh, philanthropy sometimes can step in where the government still doesn't step in, where because they're risk averse, they don't really. It's like uh, Eli Horvitz said, "I'm in the business of deploying capital, giving money away." Right. So. Um, when you're going to deploy capital and you don't care about returns, then the best way to do it is to put it in a place where the, the result is going to be the incubation of companies that will later be funded by uh, investors and will have business models and will be able to create jobs, create impact, create, create scale, scalability, bring capital from Israel and from elsewhere, and create a whole industry. So it might be a good thing to, to, for, for philanthropists to think about their role in providing a sort of first loss cushion or, or a, uh, a stepping stone uh, with philanthropic capital to uh, nurture the companies and fund them to a certain stage when they become uh, investment ready. And it's not only, only about funding, it's about a, a whole array of things that you might uh, think about, uh, talk about later that will, will provide the startups with the, uh, the necessary tools to, to be fundable and to move on. Um, so, so government, philanthropists, and, and also stakeholders. Stakeholder involvement is very important. For instance, if you bring stakeholders, and maybe we will elaborate a little bit about that. Um, when you bring stakeholders who say, okay, my problem is um, level of dropouts, or my problem is that not enough children uh, graduate with uh, five points of uh, mathematics, or my, and, you, and you define, and they are the stakeholders, they define the problem. And they're willing to put in some capital to help solve this problem. And to them, it's an investment in the future. It's not about getting financial returns. Then they, they um, uh, identify the problem. They tell you how to solve it. They help you uh, look at, their, at the solution and, and test it together with them. So they provide uh, a partnership which is much more than capital that will bring the companies to, to the next level. So, so it's a, it's a um, sort of opportunity that is very lucrative and available for a lot of people who are not looking at returning capital. And then it will also create opportunities for us, the ones who do want to create capital as well as impact, to invest further into these companies. So these companies will have somewhere to go after they're done with the uh, incubation process. So who's, who's in charge of this? Because you sort of, the, the way I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm a bit of devil's advocate. You're sitting here and you're saying, they're not ready for it, we don't have the ecosystem, so we're just gonna sit down and drink coffee until they show up. 
can, can we do something? Maybe that's the role of impact, is to prepare them for that and work with the stakeholders and the government and the philanthropy. And that's the value add. We need, we need, we need uh, as many success stories as possible. And what I mean by success stories, it's not only the impact of education, its success story is the, is the ability to combine both together the double bottom line, meaning you need the social impact, but you need to, to uh, present very nice returns because what you want is business models. Only with business models you can solve the problems. And so we need some success stories and the government always comes afterwards. Okay, so it's good success stories. It's not only the matter of government. I mean, also the most of regular investors, business investors in Israel, see impact investing in general as philanthropy. And this is completely wrong. Because when you look at a, a different kinds of a, a analysis they did, I heard of a new one uh, from uh, Gini or anything like that, that impact investing has great returns compared to regular businesses. So we need to to deeply understand that impact investing is regular investment. Once, the more we understand that impact investment is regular investment, the bigger chances will be that we'll succeed with EdTech or anything else uh, uh, regard what we're dealing with. So I wanna uh, continue to um, what Yoel was saying about creating success stories and what we've been doing for the past two years is trying to do exactly that um, through really constructing the ecosystem from uh, like bottom up. And part of it, as Cecile was saying before, is engaging partners or corporations, for that matter, that have the ability to invest the money and to just make um, amazing resources accessible for entrepreneurs and not expect any capital in return. So what we do in other industries, not in ed tech yet, but if you have suggestions, then I'd be happy to hear. Um, but for instance, I'll take Nuva who has been our partner in the food tech industry, and Knuva has set for themselves a challenge to improve the nutrition that they're putting on every table in Israel. And they realize that they can't do it alone, and they have to outsource the innovation um, to entrepreneurs that are more connected to the field and that are not um, being, uh, um, um, and that are acting from, from, from different perspectives than you know, a huge corporation such as Tnuva. And what we've been doing with them is defining the challenges in the um, nutrition part and wellness and how you can prevent diseases through um, the food industry. And we've actually, uh, just yesterday, we've um, ended the application period to our program. And this is the third time we've been doing this with Tnuva. And two years ago, when we started out, they were so disappointed, they were so frustrated. They said, you know, the entrepreneurs, they're, it's cute ideas, they're nice, but it's early stage, it's not something that's applicable, it's not necessarily relevant to what Nuva is talking about. And yesterday, we were so happy to see that there are so many more entrepreneurs, that the ideas are much more developed, much more relevant, um, coming with professional teams, and I think that the role of corporations and NGOs, for that matter, that have so much professional um, know-how, that have the knowledge, that have the regulation uh, uh, knowledge, that can bring in so much that is not necessarily money, just to make sure that we do have the good deal flow that can create some impact and come to these investors and show them that this could really happen, and then the capital will follow. So I want to turn the table for a second. Uh, there are entrepreneurs in the room, and you've heard what the problem is with you. Would love for one entrepreneur or more to tell us what the problem is impact investors. Is there anybody who's willing to take the challenge? OK. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so if I'm an, I'm an aspiring entrepreneur and I'm looking for investment in my new technology Closer. company, essentially coming to you, I'm committing myself also to my business model, but also to the impact objectives. How does partnering with an impact firm, uh, how is partnering with an impact firm or taking impact money uh, preferable to normal VC funding? 
So is the question is, is when you, you, you take money from an impact investor, um, is it, and I'm rephrasing a bit, is it affecting your business model because you're taking a double commitment? With the assumption that what I'm doing causes impact as we're defining it broadly here, yes, I'm, I'm making a double commitment. Y your answer is yes, and that's what I said about aligning interests in the beginning. You need to align your interests with your investors. They are looking for two different things for returns. They do want to see social returns. You're not going to be able to take their money and then change your business model down the road, or at least not if the contracts are done right. You're not going to be able to change your business model and all of a sudden drop the good part because you just got a better market somewhere else in a higher volume area for higher yield individuals. That's not going to work. So yes, but, but look at the example of a strategic investor, not a VC, but a strategic investor. We've had them around multinationals. There are 240 operating in Israel. Most of them came in through strategic investments. They bought companies, they invested in companies, and they had goals. They needed to cooperate not just for financial returns. Those companies also had to stay true to the goals of their investors. It's very similar. It's coming. So um, I'm actually seeing uh, the problem in reverse many times. Uh, I see entrepreneurs that come to us and say, Oh, thank God, I'm sitting with people who want to make social impact. I'm so used to presenting to investors and I had to hide the fact that I want to make social impact because they're afraid that I'm not going to make them any money because I have social impact on my mind. So um, sometimes I get entrepreneurs saying, don't invest or invest a very small amount. Just put your name with us and make sure that we are aligned so you can help us frame our uh, social impact and, and understand where we want to go and how do we blend this into our business model and how do we make sure that we measure it and that we can really uh, put set our sights on making impact and making profits and actually measure what we did and make sure that we did that. So um, so I'm seeing the, the other side uh, of the equation uh, and I think that generally speaking uh, a venture capital or an impact venture capital like we are will be looking at the exact same things as venture capitals will be looking at. So a great team, a great idea, solution for an amazing uh, problem. Uh, it doesn't have to be disruptive, by the way. I'm not crazy about the word disruptive. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, the trick is about seeing who the, the uh, impact entrepreneurs really are. And is it in their DNA? Is it, I think this is something you wanted to say, uh, what you said, uh, Omoy, is it within what they believe? And how easy is it going to be to uh, create a mission drift and get out of the uh, impact stream and go to some other market or some other um, application that doesn't have any impact? Uh, all these things are up to us as investors to screen and try to figure out, are you for real? Are you, are, are you a real impact entrepreneur? Are you really committed to what you want to, uh, to create in terms of social impact? And are you capable of creating a true business model and performing on it and executing and, and reaching the goals of your financial returns that you set yourself? So it's a skill set that, uh, you know, it's, it's, when it's embedded in the DNA, then it's almost a no-brainer. But uh, maybe other investors will tell you, okay, well, and, and then we've seen that. Uh, uh, you're, you have a nice idea. Uh, it's applicable for this and that market, which is no impact whatsoever. And there, this is where the money is. So let's first focus. We'll invest. Let's first focus here. And then one day we'll come and take care of your uh, impact uh, mission. And if you agree to that, then it's really not in your DNA. And uh, we've seen uh, entrepreneurs that we invested in that refused capital like this and came to us and said, huh, finally somebody understands who we are. So it's a, it's a dialogue. So there's something interesting that, that we've seen in the U.S. and, and talking to um, uh, about the track record is we've seen non-impact investors investing with impact investors. The non-impact investors bringing the leverage, the capital, because typically the impact funds are smaller, and the impact investors bringing the domain expertise. Uh, not about making an impact, but you know, impact is usually in a couple of verticals. And is there a scenario in, you know, when the market matures in, in Israel where we see those two living together and investing together? And maybe of course. We're part of the, uh, she says three minutes. Uh, <laughs> we're part <laughs> I, of the, uh, the Pitango Group, of, uh, which is Israel's largest venture capital. And, uh, and I believe that uh, we're a Trojan horse in that sense. So we're, we're uh, letting the venture capital industry here in Israel fall in love with us. And eventually they'll all be doing impact investing. And uh, 
we provide them with the market expertise and the domain expertise of impact, like, like you said. We also make them look good. They like us. Uh, we're reversing the table. Uh, if uh, a year ago people would ask me, oh, can you introduce me to Chemi Perez, the head of uh, Pitango? Now it's vice versa. I get twice a week, I get emails saying, oh, uh, Chemi, can you introduce us to Cecile? Okay. Uh, which is, it's funny. Um, but this is where we're going. And I believe this is really where we're going. And, and non impact investors will definitely team up with impact investors and invest later on. Do you, do you have the same limited partners uh, as Pitango? No, we have different limited partners, even though the Pitango's limited partners, which come from the alternative asset management, are also establishing their own impact funds as funds of funds, and they're looking at us for investment uh, opportunities. There, there, could, there could be a strong conflict. I mean, let's say it's a VC that uh, its goal is to maximize profit, and its goal to maximize profit, if it changes the, uh, the goal, uh, I might say very clearly, this is immoral. It's immoral for in the investor, the contract with their investors. Their investor put their money, it might be a, a, a Mossadim, all different kinds of uh, legal entities which help uh, different kinds of populations. And their goal and their contract and they're committed to maximize their profit. And sometimes if you have, Cecile, uh, let's say, an impact investing fund that goes to some kind of a first year VC, I don't know, Bessemer or whatever in Palo Alto, and you tell them, okay, this is the social thing and we want to, to raise your money, they, they will definitely tell you, okay, if you want to have a, you have a great idea, there's a potential for a great uh, ROI, but if you don't uh, focus on the, the capital side, then we cannot invest. So there is a conflict actually, what? With technology. The, the, the goal is to, to, to find the singular point where the, the social and the, uh, the economical are combined together. This is the magical spot that we're all looking for. If it's a little bit here, it's a little bit there, so you have all different kinds of problems. So I want to use the three minutes that Yossi gave us, Josh took uh, two, I'll take one. Any parting statements from Vanessa Omri or the rest of the, the group before uh, we break up for coffee? I'll use it as a free advertising second here. Um, we just brought four entrepreneurs to pitch in New York and San Francisco to our investors there, um, and we'll be investing about half a million dollars across three of the companies that came. We'll be looking to do that again in the fall, so looking for ideally two fantastic ed tech companies to bring to pitch again. Can't follow that. Um, <laughs> I think I just want to say that um, we see so many entrepreneurs that are so frustrated and a lot of them are coming from the professional side or from the social side and saying, you know, I don't have the know-how of how to create like a business model for this. I'm not from the high-tech industry. Solve this. There are so many tech entrepreneurs that are looking for something a bit more meaningful than gambling or, excuse me for saying, fintech and cyber and things like that, which are great. Find those co-founders and then come to us, to all of us. But I think that you have to do the legwork and really not give up on, you know, saying, yeah, but I'm more like, you know, I'm more to the social side, I'm more to this side. Because if you... <laughs> Hello? Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to say, as Joel said at the beginning, we do need success stories. And in order to create them, it's, it's all depending on you at the end. So you have to do the, the hard work and we can only help. Um, so go do it. <laughs> you asked who's minding the shop, right? Who's in charge? Who's in charge of, of creating this ecosystem? Uh, yeah, bit. well, no, I'm the not. The, the thing is, I think... <laughs> oh my God. You didn't say the grandmother, that's good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think that... I challenge, thank you, see, legal counsel, again. Um, I think that we need to challenge people that are organizing this conference in thinking deeper on how to create the stepping stone to enable us as the investors to step in with the capital and the ability to bring the companies to the next level. Thank you for uh, joining me thanking the panelists.